everyone, this is Al Fadi, and I want to thank you, of course, for joining us uh, today yet in another uh, episode of this uh, series. I hope you're enjoying it. Uh, you can see that the main theme so far is that we're putting the spotlight on the history of Islam, early history of Islam, standard Islamic narrative, its sources, its dating, and the list can go on and on and on. What are we trying to prove? We're trying to show that Everything we know about Islam, if we were to rely on these sources, comes at a later time. There is a big gap between the life of the man, Muhammad, and the history of Islam and everything that has to do with his own sayings, his revelations, and so on and so forth. This is why it is extremely important for those of you, especially our Muslim friends, to please don't attack us. Just go and investigate the data that we are pre presenting to you ask yourself this question, would you, would you, hypothetically speaking, follow a religion, let's say you're not a Muslim today, follow a religion that you discover that everything that is known about it is actually put together and packaged together at least between 100 to 200 years after its alleged origin? And ask yourself this question, would you feel comfortable following something like that? Do you feel that you have a solid foundation to stand on? And are you able also to share the same dating problem and sources problem with others whom you are trying to invite to follow the same faith that you have fallen in love with, even though it has a lot of problems when it comes to its standard narrative? Where today, uh, we are going to continue with this discussion, technically speaking, but we called this episode the, uh, the absence of evidence for a reason. And uh, with me here to unpack that is our dear brother, Dr. Jay Smith. Dr. Jay, welcome back. Uh, you know, we specifically chose this title for a purpose, the absence of evidence. If you want to elaborate a little bit more on that. Now, this came from a debate I had back in 1995 at Cambridge University, Trinity College with Dr. General Badawi. I had been down at Speaker's Corner earlier in uh, 19, um, 1993, 1994, introducing what Gerald Hotting was teaching us in his class. I talked about Dr. Gerald Hotting at School of Warrington African Studies and all of the Muslims that left the class within two weeks. Uh, I, I was excited by this fact because it showed me that this was a real problem for the Muslim students. These were Muslim students. These were academic students. These were quite intelligent, quite intellectual, and they were all slamming the door as they left because they, didn't, they were having a crisis of faith. Every one of them was going through a crisis of faith, looking at these really simple references, such as the fact that there was no Qibla, that was facing Mecca as early uh, until around, uh, in this case, we now know 727. There's and Muhammad died in 632. The Qiblas don't begin to face Mecca for over uh, almost 100 years at, uh, later. And all the Qiblas, and I didn't even know this in 1995 because we didn't know this, that Gibson hadn't done his research yet, or he hadn't published his research yet. Uh, we were going what Dr. Patricia Corona had found, and she noticed that they were all pointing further north, but she didn't know where. Most scholars in 1995, when I was taking this course, believed it was Jerusalem at that time. Huge a huge problem if all the Kibbles are facing Jerusalem. We now know it was Petra, more like it was Petra because of Gibson's research, which is just about 100 miles away, so roughly in the same area, but that's 600 miles further north. If all the Kibbles for all the mosques up until 706, every one of them are uniquely facing this position over 106 or 600 miles further north, that is a huge problem. And I remember uh, bringing this up into this debate and General Badawi turned to me and says, Mr. Smith, the absence of evidence doesn't prove the evidence of absence. And I was kind of caught flat-footed at that time. That's true. I, 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 I just did have, I said, it's screaming for evidence, though. The fact that there's absence there, there's screaming for evidence because this is only 1,400 years ago. We're not talking about 2,000 or 3,400 years with Moses. We're not talking about thousands of years ago. We're just talking about 1,400 years ago. That's not very long. That is very recent. And we're talking about... Kiblas. We're talking about place names. We're talking about people. We're talking about events which had have been written down. At that time, we even introduced Mecca because we said, what about the city of Mecca? Patricia Crone had found, and by that time, she had already, she did her book in, in 1987, Mecca and Trade and the Rise of Islam. She had written it and she had gotten death threats for, because of writing that book. And all she did was ask this very simple question. 
there's an absence of any trade route going through a place called Mecca. That was hugely significant. Which is a logical question to ask. It's a logical question to ask. And so I was saying, okay, so I don't have the evidence, neither do you. You don't have the evidence either. So in that time, that's all I could throw back at him because I didn't have any evidence at that period. Well, today, now, we do have evidence. We're going to go through that and we're going to unpack what the evidence we do have. No longer is there an absence of evidence. There's all kinds of evidence. But it's not the evidence the Muslims are looking for. It's not the evidence the Muslims want to hear. And that's why it's so important that we have this whole series so we can unpack that evidence. Now, here's the question I want to ask you. Shouldn't this be a concern for every historian, not just Muslims, but also Western historians? This whole problem that there's an absence of evidence? It should. And why? I tell you why, from, from my perspective, if you are just, let's say, a Western historian, uh, maybe in the field of academia, how can you substantiate anything about Islam if you don't have evidence, solid evidence to back up these datings, for instance? How can you discuss something about the life of Muhammad, for instance, or talk about the history of this religion called Islam, or even Mecca, without backing it up with something tangible? Okay, I'll, 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 be, I'll, I'll take, play the devil's advocate. I'm going to be a Muslim right now. My name is Abdul, and I come to you, yeah. uh, Al-Fadi, and I say, well, listen, we've got... We've got Ibn Isham, he talks about the history of Muhammad, gives his life. We have Al-Buhari, gives us his direct sayings. There it is. I've given you the evidence now. Ibn Isham, Al-Buhari. Well, that's interesting because I just stated to you that there is a big gap between Ibn Isham and the life of Muhammad, the physical life of Muhammad, Bukhari and the physical life of Muhammad, uh, Tabari and the physical life of Muhammad. So how can you now fill that gap for me with tangible evidence? Very simple. We know that everything that Buhari said or wrote down, everything that Ibn Hishab wrote down, all the others, Al-Tabari and the others, they wrote it down because they got the mutton that they wrote down, they got from Isnad, from very well-sourced individuals who got it from so-and-so, who got it from so-and-so. And remember, remember, Al-Fadi, this is a whole science that you have never studied. This is an entire science that shows who are the authoritative people from which this has been received. Therefore, since you haven't studied this, you have no right to therefore question it. Well, I mean, let's pretend I don't know what I'm talking about. Then why does Bukhari have variations of certain sayings? Why do we have different readings of the Quran if everything is really solid when it comes to this Isna? So forget about the Quran right now. I'm talking about the biography and, yeah. the, and the sayings of Muhammad. That's pretty simple because you have different eyewitnesses. You have different witnesses who saw Muhammad do one thing in one day, another thing in another day, and that's just different. So you have the same thing with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You've got the same thing. Now, your Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John uh, were not written by eyewitnesses either. They were all re put together in the fourth century. Therefore, you are dependent also on the same idea of Isna. It's just you don't admit it. We actually that's admit it. We're transparent. On this. That's not true, because prove to me that everything we know about the New Testament is based on later dating, 400 years later. We know that this was all put together by Constantine. Remember at the Council of Nicaea, where they, they had that table, they put all this. these books on it, and they shook the table, and absolutely. what was left is yeah, the New yeah, Testament. I, I know that, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But we have evidence from historians who are not even Christians that prove certain events, certain dates, and we even have manuscripts to support what they're saying. We have archaeological discoveries. None of those manuscripts are original. None of them come from the first century, as you claim. None of them come from the, the first full manuscript does not come to the fourth century, known as the Sinaiticus and, and the Vaticanus. That is fourth century. That's 300 years later. You've got a problem. We don't have the problem that Islam has because oh. we have other evidence we, that and we're going to get into this we're going to get into yeah. this but we have the original text of Uthman we have the top copy the Samarkand when was the it Ma'il, are you going to interrupt me or are you always can you interrupt me yeah, but yeah. This when, is, when was it going to when was it well, we're not going to talk about that right now that's later on but can you see but let's get back to this it's not the fact that we that these people in this time period they knew exactly what they were saying you could trust them because they weren't lying this is a whole uh, history of Islam a whole genre of Islam that you don't know what you're talking about. And that's why we can trust it. I can trust it. Why can't so, you trust it? I tell you why uh, I won't trust it. Because if you study uh, the Al Al Rijal or the science of men, those, uh, the chain of narration, you discover that sometimes they are isolated, single uh, out as liars, for instance. Or others says that I do not trust this guy in a chain of narration because he had this history of doing this or fabricating things or, and so so now we have a problem. And and here's no, the we call that taif and we throw that to aside. We we don't call 
Buhari or Sahih Muslim Taif, they are Sahih. Therefore, we trust them. Therefore, I would tell you to go to Buhari and Sahih. And Muslim. why would Buhari collect 660,000 hadith, throw most of them out, settle with 7,000 that has replication in there or duplicates? Proof in the pudding. He threw out that which yeah. was Taif. That How which did he was know? Un- how did he know? Because yeah. he knew exactly who the other, who is this not where. So but, that, but, but, but you can see this can continue on back and forth. But let me just. But I tell you why. Though. I'm asking these questions. That's the point I want to bring. You are relying on mere men and claiming that they're inspired. To I'm share relying the truth. on oral tradition, which is inspiration, right? No, obviously these are not inspired, and this is a huge point. And what yeah. you're bringing up, you've just hammered me, and I can see I cannot. Yeah. You can see anybody watching this knows who's winning this debate. You're winning this debate hands down because every the, every of every religion, not just uh, Islam, we demand this of every religion or any historical reference point. Anybody that makes a historical claim. I don't care if they're religious or not or political or anything else. If they make a historical claim, we would want to know what the references or who wrote it down and when was it written down by that person. And we would demand that there be eyewitness account. We do not trust oral tradition for one very good reason. You've been into these birthday parties uh, where you, you tell a child this thing, they tell to the next child, next child, next child. By the time 15 child children later, what the 15th child said and the first child said are two different things. That's right. We call it Chinese whispers or telephone, whatever one you want to use it. And if that can happen in a period of 15 minutes how it changes can you imagine what happens over two to three hundred years absolutely two to three hundred years of oral tradition based on somebody that you highly respect and want somebody you want to give authority to i do not trust that type of oral tradition and that's why we're asking this question now i would speak to muslims now and i want to talk to you muslims would you muslims want to know what exactly happened in the seventh century wouldn't you really want to go back to the time muhammad lived to the place muhammad lived wouldn't you really want a guy to go back there because we're going to show you in the next episode where these people who you trust as the authority for everything you know Muhammad did and said, we're going to show you where they lived. We're going to show you exactly who they were, who Buhari was, where he lived, where al Tabari lived, where Ibn Hisham lived. You need to know this because you haven't been told this. And you're going to see this is going to be highly disturbing. With that in mind... And thank you, of course, for this uh, mock debate that we uh, did. And it's necessary, really, for people to hear uh, both sides of the arguments. Uh, Speaking of the chain of narration, what is the next episode that ties to this? We're going to actually ask and see who, where these people lived. We want to find out this authority. All these authorities that Muslims have blindly given their allegiance to, Should they be giving their allegiance to these people if they didn't even live in the same place Muhammad lived? Which I did for most of my life. I gave allegiance to uh, them and even credence to these sources. Hopefully everyone uh, who's watching this is enjoying uh, this series. Hopefully it's been beneficial to you. But come back again because next time we'll even continue to unpack this about these sources. Until then, have a blessed day.